Thank you for coming. Thank Jesus for coming. Those were really, um, that was a good worship service. Where are you? That was good, Lee. You did good. I also want to thank those who are online with us tonight. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for praying for us. Let's all pray and then we'll get started. <clears throat> Father, we love you tonight. The very thought of you the very thought of the sun brings tears, tears of love, tears of joy, tears of thankfulness for your goodness. Thank you for seeking us out. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for ripping the veil open that we may come behind the veil and know who you are, how you are. Know your ways and the wonders of your person. Great and mighty are you, O oh God. And that we know right well. But also, the lover of our souls, our Father, we love you, we need you, we desire to bring you glory, we desire to know you in the secret place, in the deep place, where few would dare to go. Reveal yourself to us tonight, Father, our dear Lord Jesus, and help us to worship you more worthily than we ever knew we could. In your precious name, amen. What a good, good God he is, isn't he? He's so wonderful. I just, um, Quite honestly, I think sometimes it just can't get better. He can't get better, but then he does. <laughs> so what do you want to say? He says, he's the same. He never changes. Yet our knowledge of him, the... The, um, the, the touch of him, the, the experience of his person is so great. Our flesh can't handle it. Our soul can't handle it. And our spirit can only barely handle it. 
So what do you do with a God like that? Even people that have a lot of difficulty with authority find that God is so good. What can you complain about? He's just so wonderful. The enemy goes about like a roaring lion and he's after one main thing on this earth. He wants to stop the worship of God on this earth. He can't stand it. You can put a worship tape in, that's one thing. But when he hears worshipers coming from his church and they, he knows we're his children, he knows that we really love the Lord and we're giving him all we know to give him, the dark kingdom absolutely finds it intolerable. Why? Why do you think he has spent thousands of years to try to rid himself of human beings that love God? He cannot stand knowing that you love someone he hates so much. And that you're finding out why you're created. You're not just a mouse hiding under a toadstool until at last you can be in heaven. But he's finding out that you are finding out what it means to be a child of the king. He's learning that you are learning that you are not a person of the flesh anymore. You may seek to gratify your flesh from time to time, but that's not who you are anymore, and you're starting to learn that. The church is starting to learn that. The church is starting to learn that we are people of the Spirit. Ooh. That is the worst thing you could ever come to know. Because if you really believe that you're a person of the Spirit, that you belong to the Almighty God, you become dangerous to His kingdom. You cannot overcome Satan with your flesh. Am I right? You can't overcome him by your soul. Am I right? Well, now you know why he's, he's frightened. He's, he's feeling threatened because you are now beginning to find out the only way you can overcome him is by the Spirit. And since the Lord God Almighty is above Satan, you start from a premise, not just a viewpoint, but an actuality of having more authority than he has, more capacity than he has. That when God starts tagging you, flagging you, with the knowledge of why you were created and what he's created you to do and how powerful you are in God, Satan knows his works are going to die. And what he wants is not to have a nice, favorable community on this earth where everyone's worshiping him. He's not happy unless... What comes with that is death and destruction. So if he has a bunch of nice people on the earth 
There goes death and destruction. His fun is over. But when there is a church that understands whose they are, who they are, and why they are what they are, he knows the time is coming to an end. This is not a light thing. It's not a slight thing. This, this hour of God revealing himself to his church, that he can reveal himself through his church, is not just for the people of the world. It is also that he is demonstrating to Satan, who the king really is, and how his plans will stand regardless. And Satan cannot walk away from this earth at the end of it all with the plunder that he wants to walk away with. They're not going to spend eternity in hell talking about the great parties that they're now missing. Or, you know, the big one that got away. They're going to be mourning and grieving, getting all of their kicks out of torturing the prisoners. We were singing this song and um, the words that, that we were singing was, you tore the veil. And as I looked at that upon the wall, the thought came to me. He, he did tear the, the veil. But how many of us walked through it? We're still content to live out in the court of the Gentiles and worship what is behind the veil. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? But to enter the presence behind the veil and know him not from afar, but face to face. You were redeemed for that purpose. You were created to help others learn that purpose. He, when he, <laughs> when he made Adam, of course, you know, he knew it all. Bible tells us clearly that Jesus was crucified from the foundation of the world. This was no big, he wasn't sitting up in heaven in a quandary. Uh-oh, Adam sinned. Uh-oh, Eve sinned. Uh-oh, look at their children. Oh my gosh, it's going to be a whole world of them. What am I going to do? Oh. What can I do? What must I do? What do you do about such a quandary? What do you do when God goes into a quandary? All of heaven must follow him, right? Oh no, the master's in a quandary. He, he, he says it's because of Adam and Eve and because he knows the future. It didn't go like that, did it? He knew from beginning to end what was going to happen, when it was going to happen, how it was going to happen, and he let humanity develop. He let the earth be filled, not only with his glory, but with the people that he chose 
even though it would be filled also with the people who would not choose him, he let it be filled with the people he would choose to bring behind the veil. But what happens? We get saved, so we think we're behind the veil. We've, we haven't even walked into the holy place yet. We're still out in the court of the Gentiles, you know. After a while, we start thinking, well, I don't know. You hear people talk about the Lord and what happens when people worship him and what can happen in prayer. Maybe you're supposed to do more than what I've been doing. Maybe there's more to being saved than what I know. So they start offering up these little five-minute prayers. Oh, God, please. Thank you. And someone standing near might say, what did you pray? He knows. He knows my heart. Now, just think about this for a minute. So, the angel, Michael, is standing in front of the veil that has been torn. Behind the torn veil is the Ark of the Covenant. And the glory of the Father. Here is the church out here in the court of the Gentiles. Here is the Father behind the veil that he tore. The church is trying to throw up a good ball of worship until they can feel his presence. And the father is saying to his spirit, now go, bring them in. Let them know that I'm desiring to fellowship with them. Go, bring them in. And the church is out here saying, oh, this feels so good. God's here. This feels so wonderful. God's here. Oh, I wish I could come to church every day instead of just Sunday. God's here. And the Lord is back here saying, come. Come. There can't be anything better than this. This is heaven on earth. Come. There is better, I promise. There's better. Not only just on Sunday, but you can have it seven days a week. Come. Am I telling you the truth? That still his heart's throb is that we will come and learn how to live behind the veil. We want to do something more than see his face. We want to do something more than to read his word, although this is exciting. He wants us to know that we can climb into the depths of who he is. Now this mighty God of ours fills everything. There is nothing where he does not fill it. How long would it take to get to know someone like that? You could jump right into the spirit in him and never find an end, not for eternity. How long does it take to get to know this God? Can we do it just coming to church once a week? Can we do it 
because we love to read the Bible. It's spirit to spirit. He gave you birth in the spirit so that you could relate to your spiritual father. He said, I'm looking for those. Listen, I'm looking for those who worship me in spirit and truth. The church is out here saying, I wonder what that means. God is saying, I'm spirit. I'm truth. Let me do it through you. And we'll both find the fellowship wonderful. But just the moment of worship isn't enough. How, how many of you agree with that? There's got to be more. There's got to be more. And you're the only ones that can make that happen. No one can do it for you. But you must make it happen. Because the loss is yours if you don't. Furthermore, God has many great things he wants to do through you, in you, and through you in the days ahead. So you won't, you won't even come into the fullness of your calling if you don't let him teach you how to walk in the spirit. And if you don't let him teach you how to live behind the veil. When ministers come together with the congregation, whether it's once a week, three or four times a week, it doesn't matter. The goal is, how do I bring you closer to God? Not closer to me, but closer to God. How do I show you the ways of your heavenly Father and show you how to come into the threshold and let him draw you in to the place that you are living and dwelling behind the veil. Paul says, you live in the spirit, walk in the spirit. It's not enough to go behind the veil and just live. Walk in the, the life behind the veil. And God will share every human experience with you in a tangible way. How many times have you been in the Word and you read something and you think, boy, that's so sweet, that's so good, that's so wonderful. And then you hear a voice telling you the meaning of that passage you didn't know before. Have you experienced that? God doesn't just say that for Bible reading. He wants to walk and talk with you day by day, week by week, month by month. He wants to develop you. He wants to enlarge you in himself. He wants to mature you in the life of the Spirit. So what stands between us in the veil that's been rent. What is our problem? Number one, we don't know. We don't have to stay out here. Number two, we don't know how to get back here. Number three, we have flesh and soul that like to interrupt 
the life of the Spirit. Even give you reminders. Do you remember when you used to come home from work and you would just remember this now, that hot fudge Sunday? You'd think all day about it at work because I was reminding you. But you promised God you'd quit eating it because it's just simply too good for a Christian. <laughs> and yet every day, I remind you all day long, by the time you get home, that thing is almost made for you. So you eat it, and when you finish, Lord, I'm sorry, I made a promise and I didn't keep it. And the Lord, <laughs> the Lord is looking at his calendar and he's going, yep, March 1st, March 3rd. <laughs> I've got to help this girl. Our flesh keeps wanting to be served, right? And our soul wants a little bit of that service too. And every time that flesh gets in front of the spirit and the soul moves out from under the protection of the spirit, Satan can wreak havoc and we lose a little bit of ground in God. But he's so forgiving because he has a plan. He has a vision he wants you to fulfill. He has a plan of what he wants to give you here so that you'll be ready to absorb everything you're going to get at heaven early. Don't underestimate your Christianity. Don't underestimate the call of God for your life. I can remember an experience that I had with the Lord many years ago. This is like 35 years ago or so. And I'm feeling great concern for the church, just tremendous concern. And I'm, I'm sitting on like a curb and I'm crying out to the Lord to come and to meet the church and heal the church and protect the church. I'm just crying to my heart's content when the Lord appears to me and he's hovering above me, I would say maybe six or eight feet. And he hears my prayers. Now, I think I'm praying a really great prayer because it's very unselfish. You know, I'm thinking about the church. I'm caring about the church and who are you going to go to for the church but God, right? So I see nothing wrong with my prayers. Plus, my heart is broken. And the Lord says to me, Nita, come and be in me. And I said, Lord, I, I can't. I can't do that. You're God. I'm a person. I can't do that. So, and then I started crying again, weeping for the church, so on and so forth. He gives me a little bit of time and he says, Nita, come and be in me. And I said, Jesus, I can't. You are God. I am a person. Can you imagine talking to him like that? Um, but I was. And I start crying again for the church. Finally, he says, Nita, 
very authoritative this time, come and be in me. And before I could argue with him, I was in him. We were wholly one. You could not tell me from Christ or Christ from me. We were in union, wholly united. And I saw the enemy that was coming after the church. Being in Christ, there was this spiritual communication going on. Like, what are we going to do about this? And he prompted me to blow it back like you might a fly. And I did, but when I did, because I was in Christ, this huge torrential wind came out of me and knocked that thing to who knows where. The end of the story was a lot different than I ever thought it would be at the beginning of the story. At the beginning of the story, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I was. I didn't realize I was a person of the Spirit. And that just being a person of the Spirit and the child of God, it wasn't that ugly spirit of persecution that had the authority as big as he was, and he was huge. But in Christ, I have the authority. And believe me, Satan doesn't really want you to believe that. He doesn't want you to believe it. He doesn't want you to know it. He doesn't want you to understand it. And he certainly doesn't want to see you commit to a life walking in that kind of authority. Now, here's another story that might seem a little strange, but this was something I lived. My daughter Ricky and I were headed to a place off of I-5 where I was going to be ministering. And we had her daughter with us, and she was just a little baby. And I would say maybe a year old. And she sound asleep. As we're driving up I-5 from our home in Fresno, I was getting a mammoth migraine. I mean, this migraine was so bad, I could hardly see in front of my car. And I'm thinking, how am I going to minister when I'm not sure I'm even going to get there? And I'm praying. Suddenly, I'm telling you the truth before God, what happened. I'm still stymied over it. Suddenly, my little granddaughter, maybe a year old, wakes up out of a sound sleep. I said, I had said nothing. I was praying quietly because I didn't want to wake Tiffany up. And I hear this wee little voice saying, Debo, let go of my grandma's head. That's all she said. And my migraine was gone. Tiffany didn't even know what she was doing. She was being used by her father. It isn't that she was so spiritual at a year old, she knew exactly what to do. I like telling that story because if he can use a year old baby to get rid of a massive migraine in me, what can he do with you? What can he do through you? I, this same child, Tiffany, has had many trips to heaven, 
She has been visited by the Lord many times at home. Of course, she's an adult now with her own children. And I can tell you different times in her life that the Lord unexpectedly used her to do things you'd never believe could come out of a child. But it isn't just for Tiffany's sake that he's doing this. It's for the sake of anyone who wants to hear it. He will use you if you are available. You don't have to be 50 or years old in the Lord, or 20 years, or 10. What you do need to do is have faith. Faith that God wants to use you. Yeah, but I'm not like, you know, like his disciples. The only difference between you and his disciples is that they traveled with him for three and a half years face to face. I don't know how long you have walked with the Lord. <laughs> I can remember I was telling a friend of mine, this was again many, 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 many years ago. I said, have you ever thought about what it would be like to walk with Jesus like the disciples did? And my friend said, oh yes, who hasn't thought about that? I said, yeah, well, I just got around to thinking about it recently. And as I said that, the Lord said to me, what you have with me right now is greater than anything they knew before my resurrection. We think it's so wonderful what they must have experienced those three and a half years, and they saw amazing things. But you know, all of that is inside of you. I say, all of that is inside of you. I want to read a scripture to you. And now Israel... What does the Lord, your God, require of you? But reverently to fear the Lord your God. That is, to walk in all of his ways, to love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all of your mind and heart and your entire being. That's the way the Amplified reads. Think about that. It isn't a Sunday school teacher telling you this. It's the God, it's, it's our God himself saying it. Fear the Lord. Fear him. Not, not like a child who's afraid of getting caught. But fear him with all honor and reverence for who he is. And he says that because if you don't have the fear of the Lord, you don't dare want to get too close to him. The fear of the Lord is what protects you when you're walking closer to the Lord. And it's something you can't build up. He has to grant it. I'll say tonight, if you don't have the fear of the Lord, if you don't think you do, start praying for it. And the minute he gives it to you, your walk has a chance, has an opportunity to start developing afresh and anew. That has to come first. 
and to walk in his ways. Now, that's you. So that can be a toughie. You're accustomed to doing this, you're accustomed to doing that, and you know, well, a lot of Christians do that. That's what you tell yourself. But you know in your heart you shouldn't be doing it. You shouldn't be yielding to that kind of stuff. You shouldn't be thinking about that kind of stuff. I'm not talking about gross sin here. I'm just talking about loving the temporal world you live in. Too much. But the word says to walk in his ways. Not by the traditions of man. Not by the ways of the world. Those, those, that, that world, that community of human beings, they think differently. They feel different. There isn't that hunger for holiness or the hunger for righteousness or the hunger to know and understand God and to please him in the things that they do. If they like it, they do it. If they don't like it, they don't do it. That's the way the world is. But that's not the way you walk with God. The way you walk with God is to give up all of those things that the world, if it likes, will do. If it doesn't, it won't. But it's according to their pleasure and their willingness to invest in that pleasure. As a Christian, we must come to a place of so loving God that we want to know and understand his ways more than anything else in our lives. I was walking along a beach, and this was the first of three times that the Lord spoke to me in what I'm going to share with you. I'm walking along a beach, I'm praying, and the Lord interrupted my prayers. And he said to me, Nita, would you like to come to know and love me as my son did when he was on this earth? I did the same thing I did before he took me up into him. I said, Lord, he, he's, he, he's God. I can't come to know and love you the way, the way he, he did. He's God. So I'm walking along, and he says to me again, Nita, would you like to come to know and love me as my son did when he was here on this earth? I said, Father, I would love that, but he is God. Please understand, I'm just human. He was quiet. I keep walking. And I hear a third time, Nita, would you like to come to know and love me as my son did when he was here on this earth? I felt desperate to help him understand the problem <laughs> with this invitation. So I tried one more time. Father, Jesus... I know that he was all man, but he was also all God. I'm not God. 
I'm a person. How can I possibly come to know you and love you as Jesus did when he was here on the earth? Yes, I would like that, but there's this problem. And that was it. Over the next nine months, he visited me two more times. And each time, he asked me the same question, three times. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is do you think his invitation was to me only? So, are you saying you think you could come to know and love him? If that's true, why aren't you beating down heaven's doors? You've got an open invitation. Well, but, you know, I'm pretty busy. I do have a job. I do have a family. You're never too busy for God. Even if you have to get up and pray for a couple of hours in the middle of the night. I know of one woman that her husband hated God. She loved him. And because he knew she prayed, he forbade her to pray. And she wept and wept and wept. Please, I have to pray, but I don't want to disobey your authority. You're my husband. She just kept praying, kept weeping, kept talking. Finally, he said, all right, 30 minutes a day and that's it. 30 minutes. On 30 minutes a day, she made union with Christ. But her prayers were very deep because she knew she only had 30 minutes a day. She learned to walk with him, before him, and with him all day long in such a way that no one would know except God and her. She made union. The Lord was willing to take what she could give and make it work like he would for someone who had six, seven, eight, ten hours a day to pray. He works with us where we live and walk. It isn't what we will do and what we won't do, or can't do, maybe I should say. It is our heart. That is the issue. You're not going to be perfect, so give that up. And you're going to find out more and more and more the closer you walk with him, just how imperfect you are. Be okay with that. I'm not saying go out and sin against grace. That's not what I'm saying. But you have to accept yourself where you are. Because he does. And if you don't, you will never let him have you. You must learn to accept who you are and start praying. Create Christ within me. I don't know how to do what I need to do to become in his image. But Father, I know you know. You know the deepest parts of me what I have to give up, what I have to change, what only you can change. You know it all. I know nothing. All I know is I fell in love with Jesus because he was so wonderful. 
And I also know I'm not that wonderful, wonderful person. Accept yourself for who you are. And ask him to recreate you into the image of Christ. When he convicts you, repent. And when you repent, don't go back to the excuse of foul language, vomit. Don't go back there. When you repent, stay true to your repentance. But if you accidentally go back to that smelly stuff, just run from it as quickly as you realize you've done it and repent again. Ask him, strengthen me in your grace. Are you guys writing this down? Good for you. Strengthen me in your grace. Give me all the strength I need that I may walk with you. You see instances in the Bible. John the Beloved. Daniel. You see the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ, or the Lord Jesus Christ, such as John, appearing to them. And what happens? Before they can speak a word, they're flat on their faces because of the glory that emanates from him. That is a reality. We cannot bear that glory. He has to do it in us. Which he will do. What did he tell Daniel? Stand up. What did he tell John the Beloved? Stand up. And the minute those words came out of his mouth, they stood and they could stand. And this is what God spends the whole life of a Christian doing, is building up your inner man in grace so that you can bear that holy presence. Not only bear it, but hunger and thirst for it. You can't do that. You can sanctify yourself Separate yourself from the things of the world you know that as a Christian you shouldn't touch. You know, maybe it's television. Maybe it's things on the internet that really aren't your business and there's no reason to be engaged. Maybe you like reading magazines or books too much when you should be in the Word. See, I'm not talking about heavy-duty sin here. But there is a sanctifying process. There is this this decision to pull away from the things of the world. And as you do that, and you pray, and you spend time in his word, he is filling you with grace, 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 more grace, and more grace. John said, Grace unto grace. And grace again. As much as you need. To what? Live in Christ. Walk with Christ. To know him intimately. You have to be totally transformed, not him. But you've got to accept that. I learned many, many, many years ago, decades and decades ago. See, you're supposed to say, really? I didn't know you were that old. (laughs) I learned many, many years ago 
decades and decades ago, that if he and I are in dispute over something, he's always right. I'm always wrong. He never has to point that out to me anymore. Only had to do that once. So I'll tell him, I, I don't agree with you. I don't understand why you feel the way you feel. But Lord, I do know when we get into these places, you're always right. I'm always wrong. And I'm so sorry. Just show me where I'm wrong. And I will relent. And I do. <laughs> Every time. But if you're one that cannot be corrected, forget about union. Because it isn't given to anyone who cannot be corrected. If you will be corrected, to the degree that you're willing to be corrected, union gets closer and closer. You come in out of the outer court into the holy place. You hang around there for a while. You start thinking, you know, this sense of holiness and this sense of separation is really everything you've heard that it is. It's wonderful. And you start thinking, I wonder what it's like back there behind the veil. You may not even know that the veil has been Friend. And your mind and your thoughts start just floating off into that inner sanctum. The inner sanctum of God. You find yourself thinking about him more than you ever have before. You find yourself desperately wanting to know his ways. Wanting to know his person, the wonder of his ways. Wanting to see the changes made inside your heart that will allow you to walk into that place. Now, the high priest of the Old Covenant, one of the things that he had on his ritual gown is that his, the hem of his garment had bells, pomegranates, bells, pomegranate bell, like that all the way around. Have you ever wondered why? It's because... If he went into the Holy of Holies with sin in his heart, he would die. So when they hear that the bells have stopped, they know they've got to get him out of there because he's dead. And that is a lesson for us today. If we want to live in that holy place, we have to be holy. We can't hold sin in our heart. If we have an unforgiving heart, let it go. There's no place for it in there. If you tend to be critical of people, let it go. That's not the place for a critical spirit. If you have problems with temper, let it go. Anger, let it go. Impatience, let it go. Now this isn't going to happen overnight, right? You're not going to turn to uh, the love chapter and start going down the components of love and say, okay, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. And when you're done, leave the room and think everything's changed for tomorrow. It takes time to work through what needs to go 
to make room for what needs to come. But what God looks at, and this is the point of this whole thing, is your heart. What do you really want? And what are you willing to pay to have it? Do you just want to drink a little five-minute sip of tea with God? Or do you want to live with him, in him, he fully owning you? Or somewhere in the middle, what do you want with him? Because that will depend on what will be required. After that decision is made, he's free to do what he needs to do for you. And he will do it. But he's not going to do for you if all you want is a wonderful, blessed relationship with him. Will you just love him with all your heart? And you walk in a manifestation of his love. And you have, in pretty good part, separated yourself from the world. He's not going to require of you here what he would require of you if you were saying, I want it all. I want it all, Lord. If there's anything that can be had on this earth, I want it. I want as much of you as I can have and as much of me gone as is humanly possible. I want it all. The requirement here is, if you mean it, you get to die. Isn't that exciting? It's like a promise unspoken. So for the for, the, for those of you who ever want to know, is this ever going to end? Yes, it will, as soon as you die. <laughs> but life, in him, is worth whatever the price. There's nothing he could ask that it isn't worth yielding to have more of him. He will tell you his secrets. Secrets he won't tell anyone else. Why? Because now you get close enough to hear them. He will show you things about himself he doesn't show to most people. Why? Because he knows you'll be responsible for those things. He'll use you in ways that you don't even know you're being used unless he chooses to reveal it. Can I give you an example? Do you really believe in the supernatural? I mean, really believe in the supernatural? Do you really believe that he can take your spirit and go do something with it and you wouldn't know? It is true. We had a crisis situation. I don't know, it could have been two years ago. And um, Ukraine and Russia were kind of in a ditty. There was the deep concern over uh, maybe World War III coming out of this. Do you remember that? Yeah. So I and some friends of mine decided we were going to engage in long hours of prayer every day until the Lord released us. And uh, the two that I was praying with was a husband and wife in Florida, 
and then there was me. So we're praying, 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 and we don't talk to each other until it's over. So after about two weeks, the Lord told me to call them, that he had released us from this assignment. Suddenly, now for two weeks, I didn't know part of me was gone. I didn't know part of me was gone until it came back. And I said to him, how long, is, how long has this been? What was gone and what is back? When did you take me? I could have told you about everything I saw over there in Ukraine and Russia. I was hovering high in the skies in prayer. My spirit was for two solid weeks. And I didn't even know it until I felt myself re-enter my body. It's an amazing thing how he can do that. Now, when he, has to, when he has to do that, he has to leave an angel by your side. You can't be seen anywhere without that protection. Or demons would come in and try to inhabit your body. So what he did, he did on his own volition. But he protected me. And because of what I saw while I was up there hovering... I could tell you certain things about the area where there was the most commotion going on. And it was at that time I fell in love with the people I'd never met. I'd never met someone from Ukraine. But I fell in love with those people. We have a man, our worship leader, our main worship leader, who leads worship through the gatherings, He's Russian. I'd never known a Russian personally. But I fell in love with Russian people because I'd spent two weeks in the spirit, loving them in the spirit of Christ. And through that time, right after we were released, everything seemed to settle down. Do you remember that? I think it happened like around March or something a couple of years ago. Everything just settled down and it seemed like it was going to be okay. I knew there were other people up there with me. We didn't talk, but I saw them. And this is not uncommon if you're an intercessor. God will use you this way but you have to have work done in you that you can bear that kind of activity. But if you want it, start praying for it. Ask him to do in you what you need for him to be able to use you like that. Quit looking at Christianity as just... We just hover in the earth down here like little ants, waiting until the time of the resurrection of us all. Look at all the bad news. Ooh, yuck. Ooh. But you're right there engaged in the world. And God is saying, engage me. Then you can engage the world in me and we'll do something together doesn't that sound like a great program it is it's a great life so is everything in the Christian's life who lives like this in God is it all peaches and cream no <laughs> I don't know I don't know who said no but they're right You're going to have conflicts. You're going to have 
things that you would rather not have to deal with. But he gives you the grace, and you never have to lose your peace. You never have to lose your hope. You never have to lose your faith. You certainly don't want to give up love. So things come and go. They don't scar, and they don't wound like they used to before you belong to God. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? God is going to, and this is the prophetic part of this message, God is going to raise up many intercessors in these last days that he will use in profound ways. Ways that they never even thought that God would use intercessors. That's what he's preparing intercessors for is to be used more greatly. It isn't so you can have, you know, the kind of life where you're just sitting with your, your fishing pole on the dock waiting for the big one. You're in battle. And you've got to be willing to be in battle. And you've got to be willing to trust God in the battles rather than, you know, up one minute, <laughs> down the next. You have to make these decisions as you go along. And then it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. I can hear people talk about, you know, 2024 and how terrible it's going to be. And I'm assuming they probably had the same information I have. And they're saying, it's going to be hard. It's going to be really hard. And yet I look at that, what I've released again and again and again, and I think, well, it was going to be really hard. It was going to be very hard. But prayer has changed that. And it's going to be cut in half. So although it's going to be hard, there are going to be some bumps, and they're going to be kind of bumpy. It's not going to be very, very hard. Unless you let it be. You can't be fragile. You can't decide, well, God got you. You know how the the Jewish people did out there in the desert. Yeah, I know. He brought us out of Egypt to kill us here. Don't go that way. You've got to decide you're going to walk with God. You're going to walk with him in peace. You're going to walk with him in trust. And when your heart doesn't want to believe, because it takes more energy than you've got, believe. Because that's where the peace comes. And you are coming to know a God that few have the privilege to know. And you said it would be worth it. Amen. Father, <clears throat> you're looking for people of faith, people who are willing to draw near you and let you pour faith, trust, hope, joy, love into their hearts. You're looking for people that you can visit personally or send your angels to visit to give you messages from heaven. And they will have the spiritual maturity to know what to do with those things. And when you say do, they will do it. And when you say don't, they won't. You're looking for these people, Lord. 
the number will be comparatively small, but it's not because that's the way you designed it. People don't want to make that commitment, so I ask for grace for them, Lord. Grace to go deeper, grace to go higher, grace to believe bigger. Grace, Lord. You never said it would be. You never said it would be easy. But it would be doable. You'll give the grace. You'll give heaven's protection and heaven's abilities. You will help them learn to believe greater and bigger of you. You want people, Lord, that you can reveal your heart to. That they can stand and walk right into the center of your heart. As you take up residence in the center of their heart, you're looking for people who dare to be more than just a nominal Christian waiting for heaven to come. You want people that will be adventuresome to you, Lord. People that will trust you with everything. Everything. You want them to learn to be happy. Expectant. Even when it seems like everything is going wrong. Because you're great. And you're greatly to be praised. We know how it could be, but we've got you, and you are over it all. You want to you want to help us be giants in faith. Giants in the kingdom because we were willing to take chances. Others are not. You know who is here tonight, Lord. You know who is here online. And you know who will answer this invitation. Let your grace come upon those. Mark their foreheads with a seal that says mine for a special purpose. And let that seal and the life of God in that seal begin to develop them for a life there is nothing else like in this earth. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your goodness, for your grace, for your care, for your wisdom. 
We thank you for the way that you make all things new, Lord. Not the way we thought, but so much better, so much greater than we ever thought it could be. In your precious name, amen. Um, can you lead us in a song that would be something everyone would know, but a song of worship? Why don't we stand?